Byron here for our 52nd webinar. Welcome, Robert Rose. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad Jeez. we could. Uh, I'm glad we could get it going. So I, I had asked you during the the first break at 52. Is this your one year anniversary? It it's actually been a monthly webinar. Oh, so okay. Well, it's holy been smokes, like, and this is like uh, this a, has been five years or something. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's been a long time. Let's put it that way. Uh, many incredible guests, uh, including you. You were a guest on a, on a webinar some time ago that we that we did together. Indeed. Uh, but but we've uh, we've enjoyed covering this incredible content marketing topic for the last five years. So it's it's been quite a journey for sure. And how are things at CMI? Give give the audience a brief uh, update on your world travels and and how some of the incredible conferences are are running uh, and, and moving along. Absolutely happy to. Well, I mean, CMI, as you might expect, is thriving in this wonderful world with the growth of content marketing, the explosive growth of content marketing as a practice. Um, we're expecting more than 2,500 folks this year in Cleveland, beautiful downtown Cleveland for Content Marketing World, um, our seminal event um, every year. And then I just got back, as you, as you kindly mentioned, from Sydney and Singapore, where we had Content Marketing World Sydney, where we had uh, about, uh, I think it was almost 500 folks um, down in Oz um, who came out for uh, a one, we had a wonderful event down there and then we did our first ever event in, um, in Singapore, Content Marketing Asia, which was done in partnership with a couple of other organizations um, there. And things are going great. I mean, we are just growing by leaps and bounds. The, the, the conferences are going fantastically well. We're looking forward to our executive forum, which is going to happen here in the next month. And um, yeah, and we're just, uh, we're just tickled that uh, content marketing has taken off like it has. Well, you're leading us through the revolution. We really appreciate that, and, and all the work yeah. that you, both you and Joe and the whole team do over there. It's, it's, uh, yeah. You know, it's, it it got bloody out there for a little while, but the casualties are are, are down. Oh dear. Oh, <laughs> you know, dear. no one's being no one's being fired anymore for putting content marketing on their business card. Uh, so, so I, I think we're okay for the for the foreseeable future. So, th thanks for all you guys do and the incredible education well, that you bring to the table. Well, we're happy to do it. It's 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 a lot of fun, and certainly, um, it, yeah, it's certainly something that. We're actually seeing moving the needle, so you know, and and the, and not the least of which is what we're going to talk about, of course. But uh, you know how teams are really starting to form, and businesses are actually starting to recognize it as a formal piece of the organization is is a is a big piece of why it's growing so fast. Terrific. Well, let's dive into the presentation today and really talk about the team sport of of content marketing. Um, and I'm going to just give everybody a quick flavor. So, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, both Robert and I are going to walk through this this deck together. I'm going to ask him some questions about some of the content um, that I've put together here. Uh, but you know, the important thing is that there probably isn't one formula for for success uh, within any particular company. But the question is. What does a content team look like? How many members are on that team? And is it possible, is it possible, hypothetically, that you don't need a huge department and a huge staff to run content marketing effectively? So we're going to talk about all of that today. Um, in addition to some insights that I want to footnote in a big way by Robert, who is uh, some inspiration, uh, reading about some of, the, some of the topics that you would cover down in Sydney, you know, maybe content marketing is something more than just a team a sport. Maybe the team is in fact the entire company. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Robert, you know, and in, in, in that sort of revelation that you seem to come to at, at, at some point in your journey? Oh, are you still there? Do we lose Robert? Interesting. Nope, I'm here now. Um, okay, got it. And I, I think it's really a piece of what I've I've seen really over the last six months or so, um, where uh, you know the, the business is actually starting to recognize content marketing as a as a as a process. And so there's a couple of different ways that we see that happening in both large organizations and small organizations. And you know what we'll touch on a lot today is this idea of, of the roles that are being assumed by the more traditional uh, 
marketing you know folk that are actually starting to look at more, you know content marketing as a formal process in the organization and then that second piece the actual process you know so so the the what has really come about of late is okay right now content marketing is kind of everybody's job and nobody's job right so you know the way we go about a corporate blog is hey you know it's just something that we do when we kind of have time and Bob down in product development or our CEO or the VP yeah he sends us a blog or you know hey you know what when we can't find the time to actually blog we'll outsource it to a freelancer or whatever we're gonna do and that's the part that we really see changing, which is a new process in the organization that really focuses on scaling, creating content, creating and curating, really, at the end of the day. And so it's really part of what I've been spending uh, my time sort of working with businesses to figure out, which is we kind of know how to manage content now, whether it's through blogging systems or our CMS or publishing it out to social or you know, whatever the tools are we use to manage and govern content, but we're not really good as businesses at creating a scalable process to create content, to make it A, a formal part of somebody's job so that Bob is now responsible for a blog post, not just that oh, it would be nice if he did one, but he's actually now responsible for that and editorial calendaring and all of the things that become part of that process become an actual scalable real measurable process in the organization because that's the only way content marketing truly succeeds is when the business actually recognizes it as something that is you know that is someone's responsibility we're going to get into so many interesting things today. Let's dive right in. So everyone knows who I am. Let's skip over that. Everyone now has heard from our special guest, Robert Rose. Let's take a look at two, uh, two sort of you know, angles, if you will, to this, to this team sport. First of all, I'd like to describe you know, and go through what I call the dream team for content marketing. Um, and then I want to pause for a second and talk about the all-star, or all-stars as the case may be, uh, that really drive content marketing. I think that, uh, that everyone will, will learn a lot in, 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 in a creative and interesting way. First, the dream, dream team. So this is my sketch on, on the, 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 the typical players you would find. And we're going to go through each of these individually to understand some of the diversity of their roles and how important their role might be in the overall process. Um, Robert, I know you deal with a lot of enterprises and a lot of companies. Is there anyone that you think I left out on this first overview, this topographical overview of, of the typical content marketing department running the machine? Uh, no, I think the roles you've got here are, are, are right on the money. I mean, as you might expect, as, as, as enterprises get larger, these become teams of themselves, not just individual, you know, individual people or individual roles. Um, I might replace thought leader with uh, storyteller or chief content officer only because to straddle, you know, the idea that it's not always about becoming a thought leader, but sometimes it's about telling emotional stories or telling brand stories and those sorts of things. But I think this is right. I mean, I <laughs> the one that's making me giggle a little bit is the icon for the editor who looks like he's about to give me the sign that most editors give me when I submit something. Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a good point there on the editor. Uh, sorry about the middle fingers that might be thrown at you and through the editor. Uh, but just remember, there's sunshine behind that middle finger over there. So There always is. There always, there always is sunshine, yeah. So let's walk through it. So I, I think the, the, this screen alone just sort of summarizes the complexity for what a content planner uh, really has to, has to accomplish, you know, using some of these incredibly diverse tools. Um, you know, I think finally, Robert, maybe you'd agree content planning is becoming its own career path, if you will, its, its own journey. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I know that everybody out there continues to struggle with the content plan, which is, of course, you know, some of the other elements that we'll get into, you know, uh, but developing that content plan and answering these four difficult questions, how much content do we need, how good does it need to be, how frequently do we publish, where do we publish, and what exactly pinpoint the ROI that I'm going to be getting from this content. You know, that, that's, that's a, those are difficult questions to answer. It takes a lot of time and a lot of research to do that. But what are you seeing as this 
you know, content planner uh, and, and, and debut in, in, the, in, the, in the enterprise level solution, you know, the enterprise companies. What, what are you seeing, uh, you know, happen there? Well, there's a, I mean, there's certainly a lot. I mean, the, the, I think the biggest headline there is that, you know, and this comes right out of the research study we do every year uh, in concert with uh, marketing profs, and, 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 we were, and we're actually actively working on right now for the 2014 version of which we'll be, uh, we'll be debuting just after Content Marketing World this year, where we look at those that are having successful content marketing efforts versus those that are really struggling with it. And what we find is that the biggest disparity um, between those two uh, between those two endpoints are a codified, documented, well thought out and 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 real content marketing plan. And so the planner is, I would argue, the most important piece of this. Who, you know, all those questions that you had on the previous slide there, the, you know, the what's the ROI going to be? What, you know, how much content do we need? What channels? What personas? What, you know, where? Basically, you know, you could sum all these up with one word: Why are we creating content to begin with? And getting a good plan to answer that question and all of the subsequent questions that come after is the biggest reason that a content marketing program will succeed um, from from our research and from our experience. I, I totally agree. I, I think that the that part of the, the this business is at the infantile stage of development. Um, we are constantly trying to, you know, recommend to customers vendors that seem to not exist, by the way, <laughs> of developing content plans or even spying on your competitors to see how much content they're publishing and how frequently they're publishing it. You'd think we'd see some interesting technical advancements in, in the planning stage to tune you quickly into what's being done in the marketplace, but it, it, it's hard to find good data. Um, but you need all the data. Back when we were a, a full-service content marketing agency under the Idea Launch brand, we would spend between 200 and 400 hours putting together a content plan for a single company. Um, we would need to research all the competitors, uh, you know, learn what keywords, uh, you know, they were they should be targeting. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit on the optimization front. Uh, we would look at you know the competitive publishing frequency. Um, we would look at their own site, you know, score it and grade it, you know, all kinds of, of, of interesting things like this, you know, how is your site performing overall, how are your competitors performing, you know, what's your overall grade, what are the weaknesses we need to work on, where should we put money, where should we put time, you know, this is what a planner needs to think through in addition to how much money do I need to spend to fix this problem and then what will be the estimated ROI. So a, a lot of interesting, you know, chemical mixes have to come together on the planning stage for you to reap the ROI you demand. Agree? Absolutely. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yep. yep. The interesting thing, however, is when you translate this conversation to planning to a small business, which we do, of course, on a regular basis over at Writer Access, I think it's time to say time out, you know, while all this data could be really interesting to learn where I stand versus my competitors, one thing we know for sure, if you're not, caught, if you're not publishing any content, you suck. <laughs> and your customers think you suck. And you will have no performance. Um, and you don't suck because it's your, your choice, you suck because you're not listening to what your customers want and need. So we like making it simple at Writer Access and just looking at, at publishing frequency on a topographic level to say, hey, what ideas am I generating? Am I generating any ideas? What's in production? What's approved? What's been exported and therefore likely, you know, making its way to the production front? So I think you can make planning simple. That's my only point because not every company has the, a planner as a resource to really work this through. What, thoughts on that? You know, agree with that? Yeah, I, well, I think you know. So, this, so, so, what you're really getting at here is something that we we talk to a lot of our clients in advisory and workshop settings, and and we basically say, look, this is, you know, this is a muscle that will build over time, and 
it is not, you know, it is not expected nor is it required of you to come in and be Arnold Schwarzenegger when you walk into the gym for the first time. And so you've, but you've got to put the time and effort into building this and put, and that goes back to what we were just talking about at the beginning uh, of the, of the webinar about, which is making it somebody's real responsibility to actually do this, right? So what happens a lot of times is just like when we go to the gym after New Year's Eve and we spend January exercising and exercising, by the time we get to June, we've sort of forgotten about how, you know, where the gym is, much less even going. And that's what happens with content marketing in many cases when we don't put real resources behind it. We get this really interesting spike of interest and somebody goes out and does something really interesting and then by February, March, April, it's completely faded away because other priorities have come into it. And so build, it's, it's a skill and it is a muscle that needs to be developed over time. So you don't have to be an expert when you start, but you need to be, become one as quickly as you can. Totally spot on. Let's go to the next candidate here, our writer. So you've seen the challenges of building in-house writing teams. You've seen the tenacity of writers try to battle content marketing evangelism within companies and be faced with a stone wall. Are writers finally getting their spot on the on the on the podium? Are they are they getting their their due respect in the marketplace, Robert? They're starting to, for sure. You know, and I and I think a lot a lot of that has to do with the you know quality over quantity. Um, uh, you know, whether you believe in the you know Mark Schaefer wrote a blog post that got a little bit of heat called "Content Shock," and whether you buy into that or not, the 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 argument behind it is pretty sound, I think, which is that we've got to focus on creating good content that stands out rather than a lot of content that is just thrown against the wall. So, I think writers, you know, and and you might put in, you know, here video producers, infographic producers, you know, all kinds of people who are creating content um, that will live in whatever format and writers are a big one obviously for for blogging and for creating, you know, online magazines and print and you know all the different article type uh, formats that there are and, and there's a and there's a great movement toward quality there. So I think they are starting to, you know, and I think it's a mix ultimately with, you know, whether you you know whether you know some of it is going to be absolutely pulling in as you know the the number of writers that you need to fill a particular calendar and then some of it is going to be your own people who can offer up you know the core story of your brand and then maybe supplemented with you know writers that you pull in from from outside i what i don't what i what i don't like to see in a lot of cases is where the brand basically outsources the entirety of writing and production outside and doesn't start to build the muscle internally of at least how to knowing how to do it much less if they actually do it characteristics of, of interesting writers is, is always an interesting uh, point to talk about when I speak at, at conferences or wherever that is. Um, do you feel like there's uh, a way to match writers with companies in your mind, even on a full-time or freelance basis? Do you believe in, in that matchmaking process? I, I do. I think, it, you know, I think it's a great way to um, uh, you know, it's a great, first of all, it's a great way to supplement a team and, and, you know, I mean, obviously there are exceptions to this, right, where you're, where you've got really deep niche expertise needed, right, so if you've got to have PhD level thinking and writing on, you know, some sort of oncology or, or, you know, very specific topic where, it's going to be very difficult to find, you know, freelance talent. That's one thing, but most companies don't have that um, that that specific of a need. Um, and but those that do, that'll be the you know that'll be the that'll be the real you know, the the real indicator. But I think this list that you've got here is is you know is is definitely um, right on the money. 
I feel like we've we've sort of transcended to from a, a marketplace where specialists were demanded, particularly for in-house writing, um, moving more towards a generalist writer that could handle diverse writing assignments and almost be forced into publishing in multiple platforms and therefore have to have a voice that would uh, that would sort of you know, translate into multiple channels. Now socialist is, is another part of it. Not only do you need to write well, but your content needs to be received well and shared and passed around, almost moving you back more into the specialist, not so much specialist in the topic area, but specialist in knowing what resonates well with your target audience. In other words, all this translates to it's really tough to be a good writer in today's marketplace. Agree? <laughs> It, yes, I mean, I think. Well, I think I think great writers understand the difference of the formats and channels by which they create content for. Um, and then I think within that you have another subset, which is subject matter expertise versus just great writing. And I think that comes down to you know, like for example, the talk I gave in, in at Content Marketing World Sydney was around what I call the four archetypes of content creation. And there's, you know. I think, for example, you could, you know, going back to, to to my example of the, you know, of the very specific PhD level, you know, thought leadership type content that you might want to create that you're going to only do sporadically, right? You're only going to do a white paper on this once a quarter or, you know, every, you know, twice a year even because you're going to put real money, real investment into this piece of content. But then there's going to be content that surrounds that blog posts, you know, tweets, Facebook posts and all that kind of stuff where you may not need the deep level subject. You need somebody who understands the words and, and can translate that into great writing, but you not but what they're doing then is reporting on that content, not necessarily creating the thinking themselves. And in that case, you just you what you need is a, a great writer or a great resource who can produce that content for you across the myriad channels that you're going to create it for. Um, but you don't necessarily need the deep level subject matter expertise that you need for that, you know, that deep thinking piece that you're going to create. Spot on. Design, always an important element to the equation. Where do you think design and designers are falling in the spectrum of, of, uh, of, of a company? Are they gaining momentum and respect and authority? with key decision making regarding content marketing or do you think that writers are maybe overpowering them because of this uh, demand for proving ROI and results with increased traffic and improved listing positions in the search engines? What's happening with designers? Where do they stand in this equation? Well, what we see is that is that they're becoming more and more important because of the visual nature of of content. Trying, you know, in, in in our efforts to make things stand out more, they're becoming much more important. So, you know, the rise of infographics are certainly an indicator of this trend. The rise of video, the the, the you know, making white papers beautiful, the mobile and optimizing design for mobile experiences, whether it be you know tablet or uh, phone or you know. And and all of the different making things more engaging, visually more appealing um, in, you know, in whatever channels are becoming such an incredibly important piece of the engagement story. So we're seeing them, but uh, honestly this is where we see most of the outsourcing happening. You know, they're, they're, most companies now are utilizing either because they've got previous relationships or because they just quite frankly don't want to try and hire for this talent, they're, they're outsourcing this in, in, in large degree to their either existing or new agencies. Are you seeing the excitement for branding and the extension of the brand throughout various content assets? Is that still in or is it more about ec more eclectic, more, hey, your infographic doesn't need to look like your brochure, which doesn't need to look like, you know, your business cards and your, your logo doesn't need to be executed throughout. In other words, is the big brand still cool and still hip and still some of the goals with, with major companies and corporations or is it more eclectic? It's it and it comes back to what kind of content you're creating, you know. So I think it's a bit of both. Um, the big brand I think still is relevant and still has you know all of the needs, you know, like you've got up here on the screen. You know, you've got that sort of 
co cohesiveness and consistency across different content products that you're creating. Um, however, we are also seeing the rise of creation of content brands themselves where in an effort to maybe diminish the amount of quote unquote salesiness that we're having in our content, maybe it's an online magazine, maybe it's a, uh, you know, a, uh, a print magazine, maybe it's a blog, you know, where the actual content asset itself can have a brand with maybe some degree of, of consistency with the, the more global brand. You know, I think of, for example, if you go look at emo.com, which is, of course, an Adobe product, but it doesn't really look like Adobe. It doesn't really reflect Adobe's design sensibilities. And you can find an Adobe logo there, you know, if you look. But it's it's got its own sort of look and feel and brand. And so we're seeing a little bit of both dependent upon where the strategy is for that particular content platform, you know, and again, whether it's really tightly aligned with the brand and or whether they're trying to disassociate it with the brand and create its own sort of experience for the customer. Huh. The optimizer. You know, a lot of people are are contend that search engine optimization is dead. There's no reason anymore that the spider bots are just simply too smart. You can't fool the search engines anymore. Do we need to? What's your take on that, Robert? Do we need to optimize our content? We do, but not in the same way that we used to. Um, you know, I think the, the, the key is, is that SEO isn't dead, but it's different, right? And it's, uh, it's, it's not about um, the things that it used to be about. Um, it is rather, you know, I mean, truly in, in terms of, you know, I guess the four biggies are the ones that you have here, you know, and I might put social engagement at, you know, at, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, where you have it in the upper right, right, as maybe the most important piece of this, which is how often organically is uh, my content uh, getting shared out there. And I might add another one, which is, you know, in a, from a paid perspective, you know, so going back and looking at that white paper that we created, right, that one that we put money into and invested in, we actually may want to buy advertising for that piece of content. And so optimizing the ad spend for that piece of content is also, I would argue, a, a role of this optimizer in here. And then looking at things like you would a product, right? Your traffic, where your, you know, where that piece of content is in the listing positions, and you know how often, you know, and then others internal. How are your writers doing? Which one are the great writers? Which ones are the ones that are monetized the most? And those types of metrics too. So I, it, it's a huge role, but it's very different than what the classic role of the SEO optimizer used to be. Right. I love saying. Optimization is the new SEO, and that extends into, of course, old school, you know, keyword research and all these wonderful keyword tools that you're using. But more importantly, conversion, and you know, looking at A/B testing and multivariate testing to try to find the right path for conversion and trying to learn what what what's discovering. This is a fun formula that I've, you know used over the years and picked up somewhere along my journeys but uh, or, or, or modified or created or did something with I, I had a lot of thought went into this little equation right here but where are we with that in your mind you know in particularly you know AB testing and multivariate testing do you feel that that will continue to hold value to learn what images and what headlines resonate well with it with a customer you feel that that's a science that's going to be around forever, Robert? Well, I, you know, look, I'll, I'll say it like this. You know, so A, B, and multivariate testing is the sexiest thing that nobody does, um, <laughs> and you know, it, and so it, it gets a lot of it gets a lot of buzz and it gets a lot of you know, but but not a lot of people actually do it. I think those that do it in a concerted sort of consistent effort get a lot of value out of it. Um, but it's you know so. It, it really is in that sort of optimization wheelhouse, um, you know, looking at everything, you know, from the top of the funnel all the way to the bottom, and testing is a big piece of that. And so I'd, I'd absolutely, you know, see it continuing. But it's it's one of those things that's you know that's quite frankly rarely rarely done. And I think that's probably because it's the most exciting way to, uh, you know, decrease your user acquisition cost and and make your marketing better. But it's also the most frustrating because the science just doesn't always line up the way that you think it would, including, you know, 
looking at, say, an A test and a B test, which we've done many, many times, and the B test just kills it. You know, so boom, we, we pop up the B test and, and get rid of A and on to C, and wait a second, the B test is all of a sudden not performing the way that it was in that last month that we did that test. What happened? Why couldn't we maintain our 3.5% conversion rate? That's what happened the previous month. It is really frustrating. Indeed, yeah. There's, there's no doubt about it. And finding thing. statistical relevance for most, you know, for most organizations, statistical relevance is is a key piece of this because we're not Coca-Cola, right? We're not generating millions of page views in a given month. And so, how long do you keep a test up for statistical relevance? And and quite frankly, you know, marketers on the day that statistics were given, marketers skip skip that day because of beer bongs and whatnot. So you know, it's <laughs> it's it's a it, it's one of those things where we need to partner really well for this because understanding how to do A-B testing and, and multivariate testing even more complex is the key piece there. Spot on. So the editor, the editor has an important role. <clears throat> this is a fun um, topic. Do, do you feel that, that editors are fitting into the, pistol, in, into the picture? Um, you know, as, as, as nicely as they should with as much as respect as they should? They are oh. tending to deliver bad news, to your point, like your, your content doesn't meet my specifications, but how important is, is, is editing to the whole workflow? Extraordinarily important. I mean, it's so completely important. I mean, they are the ones ultimately that will be responsible for the consistency of the story that you're telling, making sure that the brand voice is represented, making sure that there's no mistakes, making sure, I mean, all of the wonderful, I mean, editors, you know, on my book, on my blog posts that I put up on CMI, you know, and when I have the pleasure of working with them on third-party places where I'm writing, they make me, if, if, it, if indeed at all I sound smart, it is because of great editing, not because of, you know, not because of the, 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 you know, the, the vomit of words that I usually give them as my first draft. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that that it might be vomit in your eyes, but I'm sure it's it's <laughs> preciously, craftedly created with ideas spinning in your head that just haven't found the perfect place on the page yet, which is what great it. <laughs> well, that's one way of putting it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I love your work and and a big fan. Um, I did an interesting uh, uh, webinar a few uh, a few months ago on what I called Snap Crackle and Pop Robert. You you'd love it. Um, it, uh, it it tried to you know, dig deeply into engaging content, what makes it engaging. And um, here's, here's an example uh, from, from that webinar. You know, there is so much content out there that's just mediocre and it, you know, at best. And if you look at the sample and quickly read it, you know, you'll, you'll see that it's, you know, I call it lazy writing. You know, it, just, it doesn't have a pop. It doesn't tickle your fancy. It doesn't make you smile. And I, I, I just, I, I cringe when I see copy that, that isn't well written and doesn't engage because I, I know that for many amazing writers, it's easy to, to take that boring content and make it snap, crackle, and pop. Um, this is an example on the right by one of the writers at uh, Rin who did a great job in helping me put together uh, my book on professional skill, uh, professional writing skill and price guide. And we have a whole bunch of examples, you know, like probably 50 examples of before and afters to just show how that content can snap, crackle, and pop. How important do you think that is? And do you think that that you know this example and and and, and others might really uh, possibly make editing and that role sexy much sexier than it is now um, in 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 the content marketing workflow. Well, I think you've got you know so you've got a couple of different approaches here, right? You, so you've got the 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 journalistic style of editor who is going to be really making sure that yes, that the that the writing is crisp, it gets to the point it actually is formatted well and it actually tells the story you want it to tell it and then you've got what um, what uh, what you might argue is here which is great editing and copywriting um, which I think and, and I think both are equally important skills to have um, that you know and and I you know your snap crackle and pop I call the difference between plot and story right so when you write plot which is you know and marketers get complacent about this where we list out, you know, we write basically to the space to fit. You know, it's one of those things where we, 
you know, we list out the features and then it's like, okay, well, we have two bullets for this one feature, you know, uh, we've got two benefits here for this feature, what do we do, what do we do, we need a third one, I don't know, it's faster, great, now there's our third bullet because it fits, right? And that's the way a lot of writing gets done, especially on the web, is how do we make it look right um, in the experience and don't think about necessarily what the words mean or how they're presented and, and I think that's where a great editor in both cases, on the journalism side, on a longer form piece of content like a blog or a white paper versus copywriting where you're taking boring copy and making it really crisp and pop and snap and crackle, um, all of those things. Um, so in my mind, editors have always been sexy, but you know, I, I think to your point, yes, this, this, this does nothing other than buffer their, 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 uh, their already shining gleam, as it were. In your mind, perhaps, but we we do have this stereotypical view of an editor that you know that that is not not right in my mind. So we we have to we have to we have to get them up there high up on the podium with with the content workflow because you know there's nothing worse than than publishing content with mistakes in it. You know whether it be punctuation problems or uh, you know I mean it, it just seems to tarnish the brand so radically. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's you know it's not only just making sure everything's spelled correctly, but it's increasingly you know things like consistency in in brand voice, um, and you know that's 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 an incredibly important piece. You know, I mean, uh -huh. not to put too fine a point on it, but I've you know, in very large companies, this is becoming a real challenge. You know, so if if you think of, of a company like Microsoft, and the I mean, overwhelming amount of content that they have to create across every one of their product groups. I mean, imagine you're the guy in charge of making sure you has, you speak consistently across when I access my Xbox versus when I open up Windows for the first time and go to a help file. And they're actually attempting to do that. They're actually attempting to try and put together a more consistent brand voice so that when you interact with Microsoft, you actually there's a tone and a brand and a brand voice that's consistent across every single touch point. Even in a small company, that's a big job, um, much less in a very large organization, but it's no less important in either. How do you control that brand, Robert? How, that, that, that voice, that message, the language that's being used, that's an intense um, you know, undertaking, isn't it, especially for a company like Microsoft? Well, it's, you know, I mean, some might even call it, you know, tilting at windmills a bit in, in the case of Microsoft because it's just too overwhelming to even think about. I mean, huh. you know, because n now, no, you know, not even to add the complexity of all the different products, but now add into the complexity of, you know, 140 different languages that you're going to try and do this in. Huh. Um, huh. And so the, the, so yes, I think it is an overwhelming job in most cases, but I think, you know, this is one of the jobs of you know the the CMO right this is this of marketing leadership in the organization finding ways to create consistency in brand voice is is w one of the biggest jobs i think of the CMO these days because it is it is increasingly with the amount of content production that we have at all at all parts of the organization right it's not just marketing now it's sales and CRM and the executives and sales guys out on the street, store, you know, affiliates in the store or associates in the store. So many people are actually out there providing content to our consumers in all these different channels that it's, it, we've just got to have a really strong way to tell that consistent story. So it's, a, it's, it's vitally important that marketing leadership take that responsibility, I think. And, and isn't that, that, that tone and that voice and that language and that style, isn't that transmitting not only through the collateral and the, the blog and the content, but, but through the actual way, say, customer service representatives speak on the phone? Am I correct yeah. in that assumption? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's yeah. No, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And the way the store associates, you know, greet you when you come into, the, you know, there's nothing worse than trying, if you're a marketing group for a retail uh, company, for example, to have your website and your blog be all about how we're awesome and we're a thought leader and we, you know, you can depend on us to be the expert in our particular vertical and you can always depend on getting the answer from our website and our blog and we're great, we're awesome, we're awesome, and then your customer shows up at your store and your store associates are dumb as rocks. 
and uh -huh. don't care. And it just immediately breaks that brand promise with your with your customer and they're not going to come back to your online property then and, and trust you to give them the right answer. So it can screw up a marketing a content marketing program simply by having a failure to be able to teach our employees on how to tell the story that we're trying to tell. Uh -huh. That's why great content marketing programs start inside and then go outside. Hmm. Yes, or they start in the outhouse and then moved into the house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So the the performer, uh, always a favorite at the C level. Uh, but what what are your thoughts on performance and and you know and and, and it's it's role with content marketing. I think it's, you know, I mean, I think the biggest mistake on measurement and, and, and what we do with measurement is we, you know, because we can track everything now, we feel like we have to report on everything. Um, and this is especially true when we get into showing our boss what we, I, in fact, I had this conversation yesterday with a company where they were reporting their Google Analytics plus all of their SEO optimization plus their lead generation, A, B, I mean, they were reporting the whole thing to their bosses in a big book. And the bosses were getting in and micromanaging everything, and they hated that because it gave them this feeling that they were constantly in this hamster wheel of having to make every single graph um, go up and to the right. Um, uh, I love, by the way, that um, you, you, all all the graphs that we've got this guy yelling about here are, are are going up and to the right, except the one yep. that's supposed to be going down to the left, which is or, uh, which is user acquisition costs, of course. But what we what we lose sight of is the goal, right? So uh -huh. what we often talk about is, is that the that the performer in this case um, is really about working with the planner to understand that goal. What is the goal? Are we trying to reach a certain number of leads, sales, loyalty, upsell? What are the goals that we're – and then what are the indicators that let us know we're on that, that road? And that's what we report and nothing else because then it gives us as the rest of the team, the writers, the marketers, the demand gen people, the room to experiment. And we should know all the metrics, the, the visits, the likes, the follows, the, all those sort of very low-level indicators to improve our process over time, but we don't need to be reporting on those. That's, that's not relevant to the goal, but, and, and, and the reason it's not relevant to the goal is because that gives us the freedom to bust something up. You know, I, just a very quick anecdote here, I was working with one large organization that had 175,000 emails in their database, and every time they would send, they would send a weekly email, and every time they sent that email, 75,000 of them would bounce hard bounce. And I said, well, why don't you just delete the 75,000 and, and improve all of your metrics overnight? And they said, well, we can't because if our bosses see that our email database decreased by 50% in one week, we'll lose funding for email. Huh. And that's the, that's the craziness that a lot of these metrics and measurements are in right now where if we show some sort of decrease, we lose funding for the idea and the effort and that's just that's where the, 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 the performer here has to be really smart about the way that they're looking at measurement over time. I've spoken about this before and I wanted to get your take on it. Do you feel that we might be closer to uh, understanding the correlation between smart marketing activity and revenue increases. And let me explain and give you an example of that. Let's say you're a head of a marketing department, you've got a nice hefty million dollar marketing budget. Let's say over a couple months you decrease your pay-per-click spend, which means less leads come in, um, your, your conversion rates actually decrease because less leads came in. Um, and let's say you go crazy and you decide not to send weekly emails out, but you decide to send out once a month, so your, your email frequency decreases. But hang on a second, your revenue increased, right? Because logic tells you you aren't pissing your, your customer base and your prospect customers, you know, pounding them with email. Um, you were smarter with your pay-per-click and turning the volume down so you didn't get a bunch of crappy leads coming in, let's say at 11 o'clock at night, uh, you know, they're just wanting to kick the tires because they're bored. You know, are we going to get closer to attribution uh, with, with smart marketing decisions and smart content particularly being created to revenue increases. you see any help on the way there? 
I think we can get smarter. I mean, we and 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 certainly your point about measuring from the top all the way to the bottom is is an important one. Um, and the reason that is is because in many ways content marketing can be more expensive and take longer to actually move a customer through that engagement journey. The benefit in many cases, and I've actually really seen this, is that we create a more valuable customer. By creating a more engaged customer, we create one that spends more in their shopping cart or in general, stays longer, more willing to share their story, and is more likely to move into that evangelist quote unquote role over time than the one that we just go send a coupon to and ultimately transact only once. And so that's a really important thing to understand, and I think we are moving there. You know, the, 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 the sort of quote unquote cute way I've been saying this is, look, marketers have always sucked at measurement. We always, there's, throughout time, there's never been a time in history when marketers have been great at measuring results. And I don't think we're going to, there's this magic panacea that we're ever going to reach where marketing is an algorithmic science where you can say plug this number in and we'll get X amount of leads. There's always an art to it. And that, so I think we, methodologies of looking at trends get us there. And if we stop focusing on individual numbers as sort of the goal and rather insight and asking better questions of the trends that we're seeing, we'll be so much better off. Uh, we, we know that the, <clears throat> the definition of content marketing is you know, listening to the wants and needs of your customers and trying to deliver to them in a compelling way if you take that one definition. What's your take on customer feedback from the performer perspective? Do you feel that we're doing a good job in, in asking our customers what they want? And honestly, this is an interesting question. You know, does a customer really know what they want until they see something they like and then share it or like it? You know, can, we, can we learn truly what they want? Through the sales it's the, it's, Well, it's it's a it, you know it's the classic you know it's you know it's the it's the classic you know Ford quote you know if you ask people what they wanted before the car they would have said a faster horse right and, you know so the the it's one data point it is one point of of a point of view is the customer's point of view and I would argue in many cases you can't delight a customer based on feedback. Because what they're going to tell you is what, you know, they're basically going to give you what would have either met or given their expectations about your brand. They will rarely tell you what you should be doing to delight them. And that only comes from being able to be innovative and do things that surprise them and quite frankly they're not expecting you to do um, over time. And so I think it is important to get as much information as you can directly from consumers to understand how you're doing, net promoter score, all that stuff notwithstanding. But I also think it's important to surprise them and look outside the box to, in, in order how, to, how can we surprise them, do things they're not expecting that delights them over time. And, 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 that, and that feedback is sort of an iterative loop as well. Speaking of surprise, I wanted to share with you a quick story and ask your feedback on it. Um, I'm actually I've got a blog post coming out, an idea launch on this, but we, you know, we we've been enamored with the with the classic question of you know w asking every customer what's the probability uh, on a scale of one to ten that you would refer us to a friend or a colleague. You know, trying to learn that all important, you know, referral, you know, trust, you know, question. Um, We've been outstanding, outstanding, just incredible response and, and results. About 88% of our customers rated us a nine or a ten. You know, blah blah. We got this uh, interesting customer that that over the weekend that uh, you know voted us a one. And I'm like, wow, I want to go read his comment. Like, you know, we had never gotten a one before. I mean, we got a few twos and you know a couple threes of, of you know thousands of customers. But the so I went and read it, and it read. I want to keep you my little secret. <laughs> so I wonder, is customer, is customer data really, you know, really, you know, accurate? Is there a way to ask customers questions? You know, uh, surveys, you know, are they just antiquated? You know, is it giving you reliable data? Can you still take action on survey data? What's your take on that? Well, I think you can. I mean, I think you, I mean, certainly, Look, I think I think you would agree that your your friend there who wants to keep you a secret and then weirdly gave you a one rating to do that is is an anomaly, right? And yeah. So 
you know, so given that, that's a nice anecdote, but it's not necessarily something you're going to look at as statistically relevant toward altering your business because of that. Um, that said, I think there's both in taking surveys, there's, you know, sort of quantifiable data that we can look at. Um, and then there's also the, the qualitative data that we should look at through interviews and act, you know, because that would, that, that, that little story would have come up through, you know, through only through qualitative interviews, not necessarily through a quantitative survey. So it's one piece, right? You know, it's, it's, and I think it's a, it's an increasingly important one to understand, you know, our, our audience, our customers' experience not just from a numerical, you know, because there's the what they say they do and what they actually do, right? So, yeah. and, and you see this all the time, and, you know, retail is actually pretty good at doing this, where they'll survey customers about what their shopping experiences are, but they won't necessarily, um, you know, I mean, they, they actually have cameras and stuff set up in the stores to actually watch what customers really do. Uh -huh. We're going to skip over a few uh, pieces here. We'll skip over the thought leader, which is pretty easy to do just by clicking our button. That's fun. But I want to get to a couple quick slides that I'm going to burn through in about two or three minutes here and then get Robert's take on this, this final selection. So um, let me first ask you, you know, Robert, if you could choose one person on that all-star, you know, one all-star on the dream team to manage the whole content process, what would your vote be? Uh, if I didn't have an existing program, I would choose the thought leader or the or the you know content the chief content officer. Uh -huh. Because Got that's it. the so person that's the person who's going to actually make it happen in the organization. And you know if I had to choose one, it would be that person because then that person could then drive either the outsourcing or the building of that team. It's probably a very wise decision, but I'm going to tell you what mine was. I'm going to spin you through it. Thought leader, I say, nah, they're too busy dreaming up books or running businesses. <laughs> Designer, forget them. They're a chocolate mess. You know, they're all over the place, but that's what they're paid to do. That's their brilliance, right? Um, the writer, good choice possibly if you're going to try to win the words of the war on the web, but they're probably not going to lead the charge. I don't think they have the charisma to unite the whole company, which is really necessary, uh, you know, to, to win the war. You know, the optimizer, yikes, run for the hills if you're going to have your optimizer. Your website's going to end up looking like Amazon, uh, and the only thing that will matter is performance, and that would be a shame. You know, the performer, certainly, um, you know, always a good choice, especially if the CEO is making a decision. We could talk about that forever. Um, editor, also an interesting choice. Um, they're down there in the trenches. They are, uh, you know, certainly we could, we could talk about that, and I want to hear your thoughts on that. Because uh, they, they are certainly going to get it done, um, and that's important. Um, but maybe there's one more candidate who I call social power. They're plugged into LinkedIn. They're plugged into industry trends. They understand the conversations happening in the industry and have why those conversations get passed around. She follows all the channels and connects with customers and reads all the content published in each channel. She knows the right assets to get into the right people at the right time for the, to really enhance the buying experience. She gets brainstorming, and that's actually really cool, particularly when you're trying to unite teams and companies to be united with the same goal, namely, let's pump out stuff that people are interested in that help build our brand. Uh, they certainly understand the power of A-B testing. Uh, they would need to to be successful. Um, they understand editing and they can at least spot check the work of freelancers or even possibly spot check editors work to make sure it aligns with the brand and the uh, brand tone, not so much the AP style or Chicago style. Um, and without a doubt, this one person uh, would, would need to understand the, the power of how to put the cloud to work to find those freelancers you know, in the marketplace that could contribute even if you were a one person in the company doing this. And she, of course, has a cute boyfriend that lets her work all the time serving up great ideas for breakfast. So this, in my opinion, of course, she motivates employees to join the content marketing revolution. She knows how to curate how to, you know, all the great ideas and bring them into the best stories. She knows ideation and how to bring content solutions to the table. She knows how to power up with the right technology and methodology. 
Um, she can snap original photographs or images and quickly load them up to the social feeds. She's curious as a cat. And I think this is actually the la close to the last slide, but I think this is probably the most important asset that this all-star would have, on my team at least. The question is, is this you? And here's a question for you, Robert. Is this person exist? And if they did, would they be your choice? I'm surprised you didn't have a picture of a unicorn up there. Yeah, this <laughs> this is a very hard. I mean, you just basically described the, the, the in a nutshell. They have basically attributes of all the roles, right? Yeah, right. And, and so it's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, it's a very very difficult role to fill um, uh, these days. I mean, you know, those those people are very very difficult to find. But if you can find them, they're gold. They're absolute gold. And let's just talk about that for a second, because clearly, you know, SMBs, even mid-sized organizations, they cannot afford a, a, a full staff of seven or eight people. My contention in, in going through that last series with everyone was, I think one person in a company can do it all. I really do. And I think the technology is, is on our side. The knowledge, thanks to places like Content Marketing Institute, are on our side. This is not hard. It's not hard to publish good content. You know, you need good writers, you need good technology, you need a name, you need a vision, but I think these are really exciting jobs and exciting skill sets that people can learn. Thoughts on that? You know, are we getting closer to that? I, I, no, I think we're actually moving further away from that because I think, think so? the skills are fragmenting um, even as we speak, right? So the, you know, the, the, the exponential growth of the number of channels that have to be managed, the exponential way that we have to deal with formats of content, the you know the fragmentation of content production across the entire organization, large or small business. I think we're probably moving further away um, from someone capably doing that. I think more to the point is someone who would want to do all of that over time. Right, so so you're it's you're it's gonna be very difficult to find someone who's a great photographer, a great organizer, a great project manager, and and assuming you can find that person, the the chances are that they that they love doing all of those things is pretty low, right? They're probably gonna be a you know the love social media, I love photography, I love editing, I love writing, and that's what I want to do with my career, and specialize. And not be a Jill of all trades and master of none will be will be you know, but to your point, a smaller organization that kind of that's going to be the reality for a lot of you know smaller organizations, especially when they're starting out. So it goes back to my metaphor of the personal trainer and getting a muscle developed. Start small, have one person do it all, and find out where that person wants to grow and lead, and and find out what you want to add on as you as you get better at it. Right. I don't disagree with needing to specialize, you know, at, at some point, but you do need a ringleader and what's interesting is your 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 chief content officer probably has the skill set and, and at least understands most of those skills we described that are certainly the, the summary of all of them. And I guess my point is, you know, you can be successful at content marketing without eight people on your staff right you can be successful engaging your customers without a designer without a you know a full-time in-house writer you can be successful putting out great content and becoming a student and an evangelist in learning about content marketing and offer a great value to your company that's that was my thought on all of that does that make sense yeah. yep it does and um, you know, and and with all of the advancements of tools and and you know, uh, amazing writers at your fingertips, you know, through platforms like ours, you know, it's possible. You know, it is possible to to have a small army of talent that are experts in these areas that you're really ring leading from the inside of of your company. I agree with that as well. I do. It's an orchestra. Uh, the word I like is orchestrate. You know, because it, yeah. it it calls to mind that you've got 25 independent musicians, some of them freelancers, some of them part of your organization, and what you're really doing is orchestrating a great tune. Right. And and if I were to have one skill that they were freakishly amazing at, it would probably be editing. <laughs> Strangely enough. Um, what's your take on that? Because you know, it, it, you, you've got to have the, the command central when it comes to publishing a steady stream of content. 
um, and you've, that content's got to be good. Is, would that be your choice as well, or, or it would not? Thought? It would mine would be storyteller. I mean, you can argue that there, that there that there that there's saying, lots of yeah. overlap there, but I would yeah. argue that if I if I'm going to have him be freakishly good at something, it's going to be finding what the real story is and being able to tell it. Interesting. And and what are the characteristics of of a storyteller in your mind? And by the way, have you read uh, um, uh, Sissimo by Kevin Roberts, the former CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi? I have not read that. You yeah. have to get that. I'll send you a link to that book, Robert. It is right. one of my cool. all-time favorite. It's a book about storytelling from his perspective. It's brilliant, amazing. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah no, I think the the you know it's the it's the ability to pull the real story out of the the uh, facts that are presented and find out what uh, the you know the core you know the the it, it's all that sort of you know what we talked about earlier where you know it's not just about describing. Um, you know, describing value, which is what marketers have historically been really good at. We know how to write copy and describe the value of the product or service we're selling. It's actually looking at all of those things and saying, what new value can we create for our customers? What story can we tell our customers? You know, it's someone who has the capability to say, you know what, we actually need to be really good at helping small business owners manage their lives better and here's the story that's going to help that so American Express offers up the Amex open network and, and has that idea and helps structure it and can you know can create some of the content for that the rest of it can quite frankly be you know outsourced for 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 at least the initial piece until it becomes a core competency of the business can you ever imagine content marketing being called storytelling I don't think it'll be called storytelling only because it'll be one of those things that is too that's too wooey wah wah for most businesses. <laughs> um, I, I do, however, think that storytelling, the media production, a content marketing group may end up being called something else within the business, even other than marketing. It may become a core competency of business that is outside even in the realm of, of of what we now think of as marketing. That's a little too futuristic looking maybe but but that yeah I do believe it can become separate I just don't I don't necessarily think it'll be called storytelling well it's not too futuristic for you by the way Robert so <laughs> thanks so much uh, here's uh, before we do that a couple of uh, links to uh, a few books I wrote the latest is professional writing skill and price guide so save yourself 20 bucks or whatever it's selling for these days um, and my original content marketing roadmap would be super helpful for people that tuned in and listen today so uh, Robert thank you so much for being uh, with us today thanks for having me this was fun it was fun. We smiled a lot, laughed a lot, and particularly the beginning part that we really screwed up with me yelling at my team members here, I thought that was really cool. <laughs> yes, well, it'll get edited out, right? So that's where you need a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well said. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Until next month, I hope your life's a little smarter, better, faster, and wiser when it comes to content marketing. Thanks for tuning into our webinar series. Thanks, everyone.